right, welcome everybody. It is one o'clock on the nose. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, I'm trying a Facebook experiment again to try and stream this live on our Facebook page. I'm not sure if it's working or not, but we'll see if it does. So uh, people are starting to file into the room. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to do this session on Howard Kotler, and I'm so excited about the guests that have agreed to join me today. Uh, and I'd also like to point out that if you're good at snooping around and looking at all of the attendees who are um, in the room, there are a lot of people who knew Howard well and were close to Howard, his students, uh, uh, people who even went to school with him. I know that um, Mark Burns is in the room. I saw Wesley Harvey, um, uh, lots of other artists uh, to whom Howard meant a great deal. Um, a few housekeeping things before I get started, and I'm just going to show a few little slides uh, at first. Uh, this this um, object study class comes out of a series of classes that uh, I taught at Syracuse University that started back in January and ended face-to-face, -face, of course, in March with COVID-19. Uh, so we picked up on the web and I've had an incredible series of guests who have joined me um, and we've really made some lemonade out of some lemons. And I'm happy to say that this is my very first object study session back in the museum since March. So some of the employees are allowed to periodically come in. So I've got access to be able to look at art again, which is a big landmark for me. Uh, so it, it was amazing to be able to pull some of Howard Kotler's pieces from the Eberson's collection to be able to share with you. And we're pretty ambitious in terms of the amount of art that we want to talk about today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen again. And I'm going to show a few slides just to kind of get things started. Okay. Um, so I thought that I would share um, an image today. A lot of Howard Kotler's work was born of activism in the 1960s and the 1970s. And this plate series, which Judy Schwartz uh, shared with us, I thought was all too appropriate for um, the social unrest that we're dealing with in the Black Lives movement. Um, Judy, can you remember the, uh, tell, tell us the name of, of this series. So this is the American Supperware series. Uh, it was a box of 12 plates that all fit in its own individual leather pouch with the title of each piece embroidered on each of the lead leather pouches. And they all fit into a box. And I'm gonna show you a slide of what the Lucite box looked like. Incredible. Looked all in so meticulously done. So I guess that this is a great time to introduce my guests and I'm going to have them help me chat about some of the pieces that I'm about to show. Uh, let me give a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, if you can go full screen on your screen, it will help you to see the images rather than seeing all of the people in gallery view. Uh, and then once we're back, uh, if you click on presenter view, you should, should be able to see larger images of the pieces because I'm going to be holding up pieces for the camera and sharing them. Uh, and Judy and Paul are going to be doing the same. So uh, first, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce a longtime close, close friend and associate of uh, Howard Kotler. Judy counts Howard as uh, one of the biggest mentors in her career. Um, she recently retired from um, uh, teaching at New York University, um, and she's going to have a lot to tell you about Howard, uh, Howard Kotler. So, uh, Judy, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm really thank thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. And Judy, tell us. So, we're winning the award today for the best uh, backgrounds. Can Can you tell <laughs> us where you are, um, the environment that you're talking from? I'm currently, um, uh, you know, switching from an academic life uh, professor now back to my studio. So I took a degree in millinery design and I have my hat studio here. I don't know if you can see some of the hat blocks in the very far back. And I have lots of different kinds of embroidery machines. So I sew, I do jewelry now and I do lots of uh, fabric design 
and I'm experimenting with a bunch of fabrics and shawls and things that I've been working on. So I'm back to a studio life. Um, on the right side is my computer, the right side of my brain, and the left side of the studio is the, um, is the creative side. <laughs> All right, so speaking of hats, the next person that I'm going to introduce wears many of them. <laughs> Great segue. So uh, Paul Katula is someone that I've known about and known for um, a long time now. Uh, he is an eminent gallerist and runs Paul Katula Project, where he's been uh, representing the estate of Howard Kotler very, very ably, um, and also notably represents uh, James Melchert and has very, very close ties to James Melchert. Um, he teaches at Michigan State University, and he's an incredible studio artist in his own right. Uh, notably, uh, he was in, I believe, the 2000 Ceramic National at the Everson, and uh, I'm desperate to have um, one of his dinnerware sets uh, here at the Everson. So, Paul, say hi. Nope, oh, you're muted. Uh, <laughs> Great. Do it again. Hello, everyone. Delighted to be here. And you are broadcasting from? Actually, from my dining room because it's uh, over 90 degrees in the gallery today because the AC is not working and my landlord isn't fixing it immediately. So, so it's great to see the James Melcher tile piece yes. behind you. Uh, so I want to give everybody just a few little reminders. Uh, first, that the Everson uh, has taken a great deal of its programming online. You can see programming from the curators from our education department. Uh, if you know of uh, children or yourself uh, being stuck at home needing things to do. The Everson has provided uh, a range of things from children's activities to uh, studio visits and uh, me doing these weekly um, sessions. So www.everson.org and while you're there uh, you can continue with your researching. So the Everson has digitized much of its archives including the archives of the Ceramic Nationals you can find all of the catalogs and all of the pieces that have made it into the Everson's permanent collection at www.everson.org. Uh, go to exhibitions and then click on the ceramic um, archive. All right, so uh, we're gonna be talking about Howard Kotler today. And I just wanted to mention that Howard Kotler was an amazing discovery for me when I was a young artist as an undergrad at the University of Nebraska. Uh, in the early to mid 1990s. And I never got to meet him. He passed away uh, shortly before I became involved in ceramics. But uh, when my professor introduced me to his work, it was shortly after the face-to-face -face book came out. Um, it was like meeting kindred spirit in a lot of ways. So I've long admired uh, his rebellious spirit, his activist spirit. Uh, the way that he accesses art history, just with this image of him calling back to another flamboyant ceramic artist, George Orr, who's come up time and again in our conversations over the last couple of weeks. And another incredible thing that Howard Kotler did for the Everson was that um, upon his death, uh, he endowed the Everson uh, with an endowment, which uh, still exists today, that is meant to purchase and support the work of young artists. And so uh, many, many of the contemporary pieces in our collection have come through Howard's generosity. So I think of Howard every day, not just from the pieces that are in the Everson, which I'll talk about, uh, but because of the legacy that he left the Everson and Judith Schwartz has had a big uh, part in that. So I wanted to mention that uh, there is an upcoming auction for uh, Surf Plus, the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, the date on here is wrong. It's been pushed back to later in June. Uh, so if you know of pieces to donate for this um, auction, I believe they're still accepting a choice few pieces for this auction, uh, but it is going for a great cause. Um, artists from residency programs that I have run have been the recipients of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund and now is an incredibly important time to support this bit of uh, private in infrastructure for the craft world. Um, so you can find the Surf Plus auction online. There's an incredible flip book. And I'm happy to say that uh, Paul Katula and the estate has donated two pieces. So if you do not own a Howard Kotler, 
uh, this is your chance to both own a Howard Kotler and to support an incredible worthy cause. Uh, Paul, would, would you like to say anything about these two pieces? Um, well, this particular piece is called the, the Limits of Mediation, which um, you know, in law is a way of diverting um, going to court. And so in this particular piece, I know I had a long conversation with Jeffrey Spahn because he didn't quite get it. And it's been unfolding, like certain pieces of Howard's continue to fuel me with ideas. But in here, who is the mediator of this dispute between two people? It's actually the viewer of the work. And you're looking at heads and tails that are coming together. Um, I think that the, one of the things that Howard was also uh, very fascinated was with these, was the idea of these windows and looking into windows. I'm questioning if these could be windows into people's homes or windows such as uh, video booths or something else. But the idea too with the mediator is once you know something, it cannot be used in a court, in a legal case. Um, the other image, which is called vanity, is an image of Pope Paul VI. And one of the things to remember is all of these decals were things that were mass produced commercially. And so um, many people had the image of Pope of Paul VI in their home and he had great respect for all human life. A really pivotal um, Pope in Catholic um, history. And, it, and one thing to note in uh, 1965, again, he, he uh, gave a speech which was said, no more war, no war never again. It is peace, peace which must guide the destinies of peoples and all mankind. Um, he was uh, a pope from 1963 to 1978. In 1976, there were accusations of his homosexuality. Um, there was a writer named Roger Pryfrelet uh, who had written two books which uh, began to explore this. And then there was also an interview that was published in a French magazine and elicited these kinds of speculations about the Pope. I'm not sure if Howard had access to this information or suspected it. The interesting thing is the Pope is made white to think that he is this kind of virgin, but what remains in the image is the eyes, the ears, and the mouth. And so it could be hear, no, speak, no, say no, people. And I also want to interject right now, Jeffrey Spahn just posted the auction dates, which are June 19th to 28th, and that auction will actually be held on eBay. Um, I want to encourage everybody to chime in via the, um, the group chat. So uh, say hello from wherever you are. And I also wanted to say with so many people who have direct stories uh, and knowledge of Howard, uh, either feel free to call us out on something that we say that it might be bullshit, uh, because sometimes there is, I think, truthiness uh, in the Howard Kotler verse, uh, but also to share your own stories, your own memories, and your own questions. I think uh, there are so many people that love Howard that if we opened this up as sort of a free-for-all, that uh, we would be here for days and days. But um, lodge your, question, your questions or your memories on the chat, and I will do my best to uh, help bring them up as we're zipping through. Um, very quickly, I'm going to show my own Howard Kotler. So it's amazing, and it is one of my prized possessions as a collector and curator. This came from an exhibition that was at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. Uh, and of course, Jeff Guido, who was the creative director at that time at the Clay Studio, had long-standing ties to Howard and the um, estate. Uh, and as director, uh, he was able to um, help bring in this uh, exhibition. And Paul, Paul, were you involved in uh, this exhibition, which would have been in like 19, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, 2006 or seven? This, you know, I'm trying to, as you trace this history, I had to be because I had the estate at that okay. point. Yeah. Uh, so it was an incredible exhibition uh, just of the dinner plates. And I was able to select this. And little did I know at the time that I was on a collision course with the uh, Clay Studio and would eventually um, become a curator there myself, which led me on my path eventually to the Everson. Okay, so I'm going to st stop sharing my screen now, and we're going to look at some actual objects. So uh, with Judy's help in a moment, uh, we're going to take you through Howard's history. Uh, of course, Howard was born uh, in Cleveland, and Cleveland keeps coming up as an incredible mecca of the ceramics world. 
Um, he showed in the May shows at the Cleveland uh, Museum of Art, um, and he followed in the footsteps of many of the talented um, and I think deeply unique artists that came out of Cleveland. So I'm going to put on my museum gloves here and respect the uh, art. The little cotton gloves that we have are uh, a little bit too tiny for my hands, so I'm using these little gloves instead. But um, oh, this piece is probably going to come as a little bit of a um, surprise to a lot of people who know Howard for his more piquant um, topical work. But uh, this is a piece that dates to the late 1950s, and I believe maybe from a period that he worked and studied on a Fulbright in Finland, or at least yeah. it was right did around it, that time. Did it in Ohio, at Ohio State. Okay. He entered it at the Cleveland, big Cleveland show at the museum. Gotcha. And unfortunately won first prize and had to make 1,200 of them. And it was his nemesis. So when I saw him, he was still casting them. He thought he would never finish. It solved him totally from ever being a production potter. That is amazing. So uh, all hail this beautiful um, uh, um, cat from the late 1950s. The textures are really amazing on it, but it is slip cast. And uh, as Judy said, it was part of a much larger period or a body of work uh, that he hadn't intended. So I'm going to jump forward and I will say that upon Howard's death, uh, Judy and the estate helped make these pieces available to the Eberson. Um, and we're able to jump in because of, of that, that work that was donated. We have work from each decade. Um, and I'm going to show you the piece Butterfly Lips from 1966. And I'm going to invite uh, Paul and Judy to um, join in on this. But this is um, Egyptian paste. So the, the ceramic itself has glaze-like qualities. And when it is taken up to a high enough temperature, the material begins to melt and move. And so this is 1966. Uh, the new ceramic presence had been published about six years earlier, um, but there is a softness uh, about this piece and uh, an experimental quality about this piece that I think is very much a part of what young artists are doing today. Um, but again, I want to stress that this piece was 1966. And I want to stress that the surface of this piece is a lot different than pieces that we would associate with funk art. Um, I think that the form and the fact that uh, it looked so manipulated by uh, and touched by fingers and hands um, connects it to a lot of that, but uh, um, uh, it's, it's quite distinctive and I think, you know, something else entirely. Uh, Paul, I wanted to invite you if you had any um, thoughts on this piece and the way that it relates to sort of Howard's emerging worldview. Well, the obvious sexuality is there. <laughs> and I think that's the wonderful thing, you know, in looking through all of Howard's work is his um, ability to really fear not sexuality, uh, whether it's male or female or a combination of the two. Um, and I think in this particular body of work, I know that he was very fascinated with color. And so the use of the Egyptian paste uh, was a, a material in which he could begin to explore the color. And there's somebody that's here today in the audience, Kathy Dombach, uh, who was a student at Ohio State University during Howard's time as a PhD candidate. And she's, I don't know if she could turn on her mic, but uh, she, she talks, she, there was an artist that came in from Egypt, I guess, uh, a painter, and somehow began working in the studios. And that's how that uh, affinity for Egyptian pace emerged at that early point in his career. Um, uh, yes, I would verify that. Judy, I don't know if you were there at that time. I know you were I was. Studio, yeah, down in the basement <laughs> there, yeah. where we all were. But uh, he, he sort of easily took, uh, ideas and ev from everybody, anything that was around him. And do you remember that uh, he was a PhD student from Egypt who was 
um, financed by the government of, e of e uh, Egypt to come up with uh, Egyptian style. He was a painter actually, but came down to the ceramics area and started playing with Egyptian paste. And that's really where Howard uh, first saw and began to experiment, or I mean, actually it was later, it was after Howard left that he used that information then with the Egyptian paste. But as a painter, the PhD uh, student um, you know, was using it because of all the colors and the way in which he could manipulate it. So I thought that was an interesting way in which, you know, I saw Howard sort of taking ideas from anything that was around him freely and openly. So, you, uh, go ahead, Judy. I was going to say that you're absolutely right. He took the ideas, but then he ran with it in directions that were totally his own. And I wanted to say something about Egyptian paste. It's an inherent in the quality of the material that the glaze is actually in the clay. It's not on the surface. And because of that, Howard was able in his own way to explore the sensuality of the material by stretching and pulling it. I mean, those lips, those blue lips, they are so sexy. And they, it is because it is Egyptian paste. It's not sitting on the surface. The surface is as sensuous as you could get. And so he might, I remember that it, uh, I was there in 60 and Howard was just starting his doctorate then. And I do remember I was in the basement of Hayes Hall. Howard um, eked out a space for me. Um, I was not a matriculated student. I'll tell you a little bit about that then and how he opened doors for me. Um, but he not only took from people, but he incorporated it in such a way that made it more expansive, more illuminating, and built on his vast, undeniably love for history, ceramic history, and just art history generally. For sure. All right, uh, so I'm going to have to keep us moving on a little bit. And I'm gonna show the next piece chronologically in the Everson's collection, which is one of his plate sets from uh, the American Gothic series. And this is an absolute treasure. Uh, as someone who, um, you know, sort of has come up in ceramics admiring uh, Howard Kotler, I had always seen photos and seen pictures, but um, getting to actually handle uh, these plate sets and see the amount of detail that Howard lavished upon them is one of the greatest gifts that uh, I can imagine and one of the most fulfilling things about uh, being a curator here. Um, I will also say that uh, this American Gothic set has particular poignance for this moment uh, um, in time as well and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so it is a wooden box that uh, Howard had constructed and for those of you who are not uh, um, uh, sort of deep in the Howard Kotler verse, um, having things fabricated, um, you know, became very commonplace uh, for Howard. And um, he began to even sort of play with the sort of fabrication of ideas and the group sourcing of ideas, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, there's a plaque in the front of the uh, case. And the case is filled with, I believe, the four plates that are inside and each of the individual plates. I hope that this is as big of a treat. It can't be as big of a treat for those of you who are out there in TV land as it is for me, but getting to actually see the, the pouches and see things unpacked, I think is um, incredible. So each of the leather pouches that the pieces come in come with their own plaques, which are reproductions of the pieces which are inside. Um, they're finished with incredible upholstery details like these, uh, the stitching and the leather covered button that's on the back. Um, and Judy can probably speak to some of those um, decisions. You can see the uh, um, you know, quality of the fabric, the satin that he's cho choosing for the inside. He had a craftsman who knew what they were doing, make it for him. That's why it looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> They were, they, they, himself. <laughs> they were they were made by Barbara Patel. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> who calls herself um, what, what was it, uh, Jesse Karn Silk or Shiva? I can't remember all her names, but she made all those pieces. So I think that's Irv Tepper, uh, who's also on this call, and Irv was a fairly early student of Howard's, and uh, 
thank you for joining us, Irv. Um, so this piece is called The Silence, White Majority, uh, which of course during the Nixon era was the uh, uh, theory that uh, there was a silent majority of uh, uh, Americans with conservative values that was not being reflected in our leadership or the way that the country um, was run. And so sort of insidious coded you know, uh, messaging, I think that uh, Kotler was picking up on this. Uh, I could get out all of the plates, but I'm gonna have to move along as well because the next um, piece is something that is especially near and dear to my heart. So Judy, I'm about to bring over um, the old bag next door is nuts. Would you like to introduce it uh, to us and talk about the particular iteration that we're about to look at? Okay. Before, before you do so, I just wanted to point out the interior of that bag is moire, which is a fabric that looks like wood grain. Right, moire. I just think it's very, he just chose material so smartly. <laughs> And it, it, this thing smells great, everybody. I mean, still, <laughs> still has that incredible uh, um, carpentry craftsman smell. But I, I also think how clever it is that it's all housed in a box that keeps it all safe, like yeah. safe, safekeeping, you know, a treasure, a treasure chest. Um, anyway, the old bag next door was probably, uh, you all probably know the history of it. It was um, Howard's uh, wonderful postmodernist uh, concept of appropriation long before it was fashionable. And um, he, uh, he, he did what Duchamp did and did it even better <laughs> because it was, um, this is a piece in which he won first prize. I, th I don't know the show, do you know the show? So it, there was an exhibition uh, of Trump Loy uh, works, and uh, it was featured uh, in, in that exhibition, which was then written about in Ceramics Monthly. And I can't remember where the where the exhibition. But was. he won first prize, and uh, Ruth Paris, who was an ex nun, uh, wrote a letter to the editor, and she said that she was really mortified, horrified that someone who used a Duncan mold of this Victorian home and then um, put the facade on the um, bag next door um, and then uh, used that mold. He did not fabricate it himself. He usurped it, he stole it. it was some of the language, I don't think she used the word stole, but that was her implication and that the piece should never win a prize like that because after all, he did not actually make it. So it went back and forth with everybody chiming in in the craft world, fabulous letters back and forth. Even I wrote a letter to support him. And then finally, after two years, Howard wrote a letter to the editor. And I've actually got that letter here and I could read uh, at least a portion from the letter. I just love the part that you have to read that, yes, I am a sinner. I just loved that he started off saying, yes, I am a sinner because he knew she was an ex-nun. And so that was very important to him. Go ahead, read it. Let's see, I, I am a sinner. I have plagiarized from everyone. In my sculpture, the old bag next door is nuts. The Victorian house mold, artist unknown sold by Duncan Ceramics product, was cast at Lloyd's Ceramics and Pottery of Seattle. The nuts were cast from another Duncan mold, artist unknown. The bag mold was made from a real paper bag, artist unknown, <laughs> by one of my former students, Baloo Oliveira. Right. The ceramic decals were made by Tim Hall of Seattle, and the plexiglass box was made by Continental Industries of Seattle. Even the title, I must confess, is not my own, but the brainstorm of two students, Michael Lucero, and Alice Sundstrom. In fact, the only element that's mine is the concept for the sculpture. Hopefully, Miss Porus will permit me this one small glory. Exactly. I have revealed all. I am born again. Hallelujah. And if you say, Miss Porus, our cultural, and if, as you say, Miss Porus, our cultural heritage has come from honest artists, then I feel washed clean and I can walk in that golden path of honesty and integrity in my art. Hopefully, I can keep on this true road. But if I go astray, I feel certain that there will be the timeless touch of thousands like you, Miss Porus, who will come to my rescue and turn me from the evils of craft. 
<laughs> well, I have to say that um, it's that word for me, the significant concept that you would allow me this one small <laughs> thing, and that is the concept of the piece. If that isn't Duchampian, I don't know what is. The concept is everything. And of course, being the postmodernist that he was, isn't that a forerunner of what we have today as well? So I mean, I mean yeah. it's way ahead of his time. In so many ways. So as it, it continues to be. It's a gorgeous piece. Yeah, many the of you have not seen the back. Prize piece in my collection. It looks pretty damn good there. So it, I will say, you know, we are in the Everson's I am pay building and I'm right underneath an incredible skylight that, uh, this is an odd sunny day in Syracuse and the, the sun is sort of streaming down and giving the sort of bisque white uh, a glorious um, glow. Uh, there was, it, I should also point out that like most of Howard's pieces, there were multiple iterations of this piece, uh, at least two if not more. And um, the one, the other one that I know of um, actually has a wood grain pattern over the entire piece. That's, um, you know, that's what he loved to do is mix up pattern and mix up materials and change things up, alter things around. And so when he did variations on a theme, it was always based on a change of pattern, color, whatever. I have to say this format while you go get the next piece is so fabulous. It's not academic in a sense. It's anecdotal, which makes these stories and with this collection of people who knew Howard, it just goes to show how we all touch each other's lives in various parts, which make us not know maybe the whole elephant, but parts of it. <laughs> but when we all put it together, you know, we, we get sort of a, a fuller picture of the human being. And I'm so happy for this goth, I can't tell you, because he was, as you say, he was not only instrumental in my life, he was, in, he was mentor. It was because of him that I wrote my book, Confrontational Clay. It was because of him that I set aside, he, I have to tell you that he did not like to write. He was not a writer and he um, always help, asked me to edit a lot of the things for him. And so we had a symbiotic relationship, you know, with, that's what friends are for, that's what marriages are about relationships are about, friends helping each other. And Howard came to every one of my family events. He was more than a friend, he was a family member. He was at my 40th birthday party, he was at my 25th wedding anniversary, and he flew, he loved to come into New York. I'm not gonna say he came just to see me, <laughs> because he really loved you know, Broadway shows. And we would go to the theater and we would then have dinner and then he'd just explore the gay life in New York. So I was no competition for that. <laughs> but I was so delighted that I lived in New York because when he moved to Seattle, it was a pioneer kind of town. He never felt really comfortable in Seattle. It, it, Seattle is not then what it is now. I mean, it's lively, it's musical, it's, you know, it's opened up. But Seattle then was rough and ready and um, it just never suited Howard. So he scooted down to San Francisco quite often and then came to New York quite often. Anyway. So Marge Levy is on the call and she can attest to that uh, evolution within Seattle and she's been leaving some great comments. I'm grateful for that. So I actually brought out one uh, last piece, but it is too large for a curator to sort of handle um, and be trusted with by himself. And maybe I'll just turn the camera uh, a little bit, but uh, this is Ladybug Pot, I believe 1987. Uh, so it has these crenellated um, surfaces. We're gonna see some images that are related to La Ladybug Pot, uh, vibrant colors, lots of different um, variations in the, the glaze, um, obvious references to sort of anatomy, um, in it as well. And we'll, we'll dig into some of those influences of the body and art deco and queer culture as we go along. Um, so I'm going to ask Judy in a moment to screen share. And she has really put together an incredible treat for me and the rest of the people on this call. 
And Paul and I both got a glimpse into the depth of how amazing her photography collection is. And Judy has done the work that a lot of people promise they're going to do, and that is that she spent years uh, digitizing her slide collection and they're immaculately, immaculately organized. And um, it's great that we have a full length volume about Howard Kotler, the book Face to Face, um, but some other publication needs to happen. And um, I know that Judy has a lot of the material that is going to make that possible uh, someday. Um, Paul, would you like to chime in about anything before we start uh, jumping into Judy's presentation? I think we should jump right in. Okay, uh, so Judy, go ahead and uh, um, share your screen and uh, we can both comment while you're showing your images. I encourage everybody to go to presenter view and also to go full screen with your computer. So are you seeing it now? Not yet, so go ahead and click on that bottom share screen green button. There you go. Okay, great. You're bringing kicking and moaning into the 21st century. So you're doing great. Forgive my, uh, forgive my old um, non-computer ways. I really enjoyed putting this together. I spent the whole day yesterday, but it brought back wonderful memories for me. I have to say also, Goth, you just mentioned about face to face, but I'm also going to hold up this book that Pat Failing wrote, and. I, what I love about this conversation is that I can fill you in with little details. And I have to say that Howard was incredibly clever in knowing how museums and how artists' reputations are made. I don't think he got as much recognition in his lifetime as he did um, in his death. And uh, in 89, when he died, he was just really pushing on to the really large scale, wonderful work that nobody really knew about and wasn't that well advertised and promoted. But he was very smart because in the last six months of his life, as he was dying from lung cancer, we commissioned, uh, it was his idea, of course, that he didn't write well, but he had, he did keep copious notes and he commissioned Pat Failing to interview him during those last six months. And it was those interviews that she was able to base that book. And I think that was just marvelous. The second thing that he did, which was just fantastic, is that he wasn't going to wait around for artists, uh, for museums to collect his work. So we gathered all of the um, works that he did and we put them in slides, we photographed everything, and we selected 10 museums that would each get 10 pieces each, one at least from, or a few from each decade of his life. So he only really worked 30 years. So that's why when Goth is showing you his collection, he's showing you works that come from a range of Howard's work, which his, his entire life's work. And then in addition to that, when we sold everything, his house, his collections, um, we had the money then to also give money gifts to each of the museums to maintain the collection and to photograph it. So every museum got hundreds, uh, thousands of dollars to maintain the collection. And after um, this was all over from the Seattle Art Museum and the, um, uh, uh, the Everson, uh, the Mad Museum, they all thought that this was the most um, generous and wonderful idea that an artist could do for them. Not wait for collectors who were, uh, Anyway, I just wanted to get that point across. I was hoping I was going to do a little essay about this and go into this in more detail because as museums are hurting now and I don't think they're going to be having money to be buying lots of work, I think it's a great legacy for artists to think about. Okay, so this first, uh, I wanted to give you a little potpourri of Howard here and his mom and dad here, I, I do have to um, say without, um, uh, I mean, it's a part of Howard's personality. His mom was a manic depressive and um, he, she suffered badly, uh, certainly during the depressive states that made Howard rather depressed. But during her obsessive states, a manic states, it made his life quite miserable. 
he was a very devoted son and would get very caught up in her illness. He has a sister who lives here on the East Coast in Connecticut. And a little anecdote there is that when he came to visit one day, he went over to her and collected some of the early pots that he gave her, brought them back here and then took a hammer to them. And only because I said, Howard, how could you be destroying your own work? And he said, I don't want things that I'm really not totally proud to live anymore. And he just cracked them up. And he, his sister has still had lots of good work, but isn't that fantastic that he would, you know, crack up his own pieces because he wants to make sure that what does remain is what he really want, wanted us to see. Here's a picture of Howard with Harry Soviak. And those of you who might be on board who went to Cranbrook and know him during his Cranbrook days, um, Howard met Harry Soviak there at that time. Har Harry was a fantastic painter. And Harry and I also became quite friendly with each other. And when I had my parties, Har uh, he lived in, he got a job teaching in Philadelphia and he would come here as well. I hope Mark Burns recognizes himself here. And <laughs> then, um, although he doesn't quite look like that, well, none of us do. And uh, here's Patty Warshin and Bob Sperry. So Howard went to Seattle in um, uh, 19, uh, wait, uh, 1966 uh, and became professor there. That's the infamous picture. We're gonna talk about his use of his profile. How it was vain, you know, he had a great, wonderful sense of himself, but not in an egotistical way, but in, well, we'll talk about silhouettes when we go on. And I wanted to show you this poster for the decal plate show when he did the Last Supper and himself as an Arab, which I, he loved to dress up. I think Irv remembers his two suits. He had a black suit and a white suit. And um, with a, you know, he was a great collector of Art Nouveau jewelry as well. And he had the most fabulous stick pins. Um, anyway, I wanted to show you these last two pictures. This one in his studio was taken uh, a couple of months before he died. And this was at the opening of his show at the Bellevue Art Center. Okay, moving right along. Um, I don't know if Martha Veed is on board, but I would be remiss not to show you Howard's three back stamps. <laughs> and that's from the Marx Project. Had it not been for them to come over and photograph these, I actually would have not have paid much attention, but I do now. And so the HK, uh, he, the, the Kotler spelling his first name was his first signature. And then he went to HK and then he only used the decal in platinum when he did the plates. I took a view of his uh, living room. I wanted to show you his influences. Uh, wonderful Mark Burns piece. I think it's called St. Vitus Dance. Mark, you can correct me. This is a painting here by Harry Soviak, the man that I told you he met, a gay man that he met at Cranbrook which I think was uh, a great relationship, a great friendship. And this sofa, uh, the Art Deco, the waterfall concept, um, and the lamp is of course Deco, the table, the use of uh, shiny surfaces, all Deco. This is a Rochester, um, uh, upstate New York, I think Garth in your territory, a Rochester plate. And I, I think Irv might know who these two works are, but anyway, that's the, um, that's the living room. And we talked a little bit on a call yesterday with Paul about uh, the popularity uh, of Art Deco within the, the queer community and some of the kind of coded messages, I think, and code switching that got to happen um, via that imagery. Paul, do you wanna chime in about that at all? Well, I just wanted to say, in Detroit, if you were uh, gay and had any kind of money, you would have owned something Art Deco. Your place would be furnished in Art Deco. And there is an um, area in Detroit called Palmer Park, which uh, 
has incredible art deco apartments in which the gay population had lived uh, there then. It moved after a while, but it was very popular to go into all of these apartments, beautiful apartments, and they were beautifully appointed with all art deco furniture and other objects. And art deco really bloomed nationally toward the late 60s and into the 70s, but I think you know, right. it's important to predate, um, or point out how much this predates that explosion. Correct. You know, Art Deco was not a term used until the 60s. It came from the uh, 1924 um, Paris Expo um, of Decoratif, and they shortened it to Art Deco, which from decorative arts. And um, Howard fell in love with it. It's all part of his highbrow, lowbrow, um, uh, discourse and Noritake was lowbrow. Um, uh, but he learned so much from Noritake. As I said, he studied history in such great detail that he really paid attention. So for example, we're going to see later on, this is a direct piece, a piece that he directly copied from. He also, this is a Frank Lloyd Wright plate that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, had the Noritake Company design um, and uh, they manufactured. Um, and if you look closely, you see these acid colors, the bright palette, the wonderful juxtaposition of geometric shape that is going to carry us through the rest of this work. This is the other side of that room and it's the same vase here. This is a, a cheese dish, et cetera. Now, I wanted to also talk about the fact that Howard was um, a historian and um, the Nortaki Company, I'm gonna hold up this catalog. This is a catalog that the Smithsonian did that toured um, 150 pieces. He had 600 pieces in his collection. And they chose um, 150 pieces that toured in this catalog. And um, Howard um, actually named many of these pieces, um, Daisy and um, uh, all kinds of wonderful names because Howard really had a penchant for language and for um, uh, wonderful punning. And so his use of language, he named all these things. And to this day, the Noritake Society, which I now am a founding member because it formed right after Howard died, um, uh, they still use that though, those names. So I wanted to show you now Howard not only collected um, Noritake, by the way, this was designed on West 23rd Street here in Manhattan. And the designers took the motifs from popular magazines, uh, Vogue magazine and Women's Day, and were, they were looking at what women were looking at. So that's a study in itself. And in fact, um, this is an article that I wrote um, for Ceramic uh, American Ceramics. And I go into great detail about um, how they designed Noritake, let's see, um, it's from American Ceramics, uh, uh, volume uh, nine dash one. Um, anyway, let's go on. I wanted then to show you other influences and Irv, do you know who these guys were? This is in Seattle, I think, but this is uh, Howard's love of uh, Hawaiian shirts. Again, panels of, um, fabulous color and um, pattern uh, that Howard uh, just adored and he loved wearing them. He was very short and small in demeanor um, and consequently, and he always wore black t-shirts. Um, to me, it always gave him a very boyish young look and he moved around very quickly um, when he did put on a Hawaiian shirt, it was always in the service of feeling happy and, and a mood swing. Um, there's something else I wanted to share. And um, uh, it was meant, it was of course 
focused on in the book Face to Face, but Howard was very, um, when I met him, very closeted. Um, and um, I was this balabuster from New York when I came to Ohio State in 1960. I was all of 17. He loved anything that came from New York, I think, so we hit it off really well from the beginning. But um, he was very concerned about being found out. And you have to think about what life was like for, for the gay community um, in, in that period. And he was hoping or fearing that he would never get a job. So he stayed closeted. I wanted to show you this brick that Robert Arneson uh, sent Howard after Howard taught a semester at, in uh, Davis. Um, Howard was pretty devastated by receiving that brick from Arneson. And this is a, um, this was taken from Howard's original piece of paper. Uh, it's located in the book, uh, Pat Failing's book, uh, of his original handwriting. But it's rather poignant, I think, you know, playing on his name being weird and how weird is Howard and weird. Anyway, I think it adds a dimension to him. He loved to travel. This is when we all were at the World Craft Council in, in Japan in 1977. That's Marie Wu and um, Patty Warshina and myself. I don't know if anyone can recognize the man. He lives in Georgia. I just lost, I just forgot his name. And as I said, Howard came to New York quite often and uh, we always went to the Frumpkin Gallery because it had so much of um, West Coast ceramics there and Arneson as well. And it was because of Howard that I, um, as I said, I, I wrote my dissertation and I'm gonna get at that in a moment. Um, so I'm gonna go through these very quickly. I don't, I don't wanna be taking up too much time. Um, please, Paul and Goth, charm in, but this is what he did as an undergraduate. He majored as a optometrist and hated it. It was what his parents wanted him to do. And uh, the last semester he touched clay, like we hear so many stories and it changed his life. Uh, this is uh, the cat that you showed Goth, but then another version. Um, he got tired of doing the one on the left and then went to the middle one. Um, the Cleveland show was a major, um, uh, a, a major showing for craft and cer certainly ceramics. Ohio was incredibly rich state for Ohio red clay. I mean, that's why we have so many potteries there, why the American Ceramic um, uh, Society, the engineering society is there and Seeker's Birth was there. Um, when I got out there, uh, the faculty, unlike, uh, not unlike Alfred, had five full-time faculty teaching just ceramics. We had Littleton teaching mold um, glaze calculation. We had um, uh, Fetzer teaching the wheel. We had a mold maker. We had uh, just a throw, uh, you know, just specialties. But the most important person was Carlton Atherton. And Atherton taught way before the time. I don't know if they had it at Alfred. I know, Garth, you went there, but, oh yeah, Margaret Connie. but before that, someone who just taught aesthetics and history of ceramics. And um, Howard adored Carlton Atherton. And because of um, Howard, uh, Carlton shared many of his notes for teaching uh, aesthetics and art history, uh, ceramic history with me. Um, his MA thesis was on the wasted cylinder, which is uh, taken from 14th, 15th century Italian apothecary jars. Uh, Howard often talked about the body of the pot in this master's thesis, uh, the wide shoulder, the narrow waist, that when they're sitting on a shelf, the apothecary, the pharmacist could reach in and pull um, the, the, the bottle off the, off the shelf. I think you can see Howard's immaculate throwing technique, uh, definitely a style. Um, but you know, he, he only took one class as an undergraduate and then yes, took a year for his MA, but it wasn't an MFA. And so when he got a scholarship to go to get an MFA, which today is still the prize, you know, 
terminal degree, he met Meyer Grotel, whose work is on the right. And they really hit it off. And I think it was Maya who introduced him to Deco. And uh, you can see the influence of Toshiko Takeizu in the middle. And um, that I think is how his work, it is how his work on the left and in the middle, but you can see the influence that Maya had on him because it just didn't seem to be Howard's style. Um, then he got a Fulbright to the Arabia factory in Finland, which was associated with this fabulous school. And the Arabia factory, unfortunately, has since closed. It was a fabulous, fabulous uh, um, factory for making fine Finnish uh, designed um, dishes. Um, uh, because of Howard, I ended up buying tons and tons of Arabia dinnerware. And you can see the influence of, um, of Scandinavian, the reed pot on Howard. But here now, look at the textures. And this is when he really started, when he came back to Ohio State, he really got involved with texture. And just like the Egyptian paste that we talked about, and he loved the idea of exploring what that material could do for his ideas. Here, he rolled the slabs into corn cob, plenty of corn in Ohio, and he would come in and grind it up and roll it into the clay. And of course, knowing full well that the pot marks would be left uh, when there was a burnout in the kiln. I'm not gonna go into these now in any kind of other aesthetic, but I wanted to also bring out uh, the idea, um, this particular pot, this is part of his thesis. He had many ideas for his PhD thesis, but this was the um, abstract expressionist period in his life. Um, but even then, look, he used fabric, a brocade, and just like Paul mentioned about him caring about the moray pattern on that silk that went inside the lining, he cared about, instead of decorating this, he glued fabric. And this fabric is still glued to this day. I have it by my bedside. It's still not one thing has come off of it. But I want to talk a little bit about this abstract expressionist period in his life. Volkis was playing a big part in all of our lives. Everyone at Ohio State hated Volkis for what he was doing to craft because he wasn't doing what you should be doing to clay. And um, Howard tried to embrace abstract expressionism, but it really wasn't his thing. He was refined. He liked detail, just like we mentioned in the plates and, the, and, and getting the precise information about everything counts. And so he tried his hand, he got a, a PhD thesis out of this fabulous exploration, but he moved on. And he moved on to these Egyptian pace and I too love uh, this series. This is the, he did a number of these um, twists, chalices, and they were all Egyptian paste. And Marge, you might be interested in knowing that the day after Howard died, a couple of days later, I was still in Howard's house because I was with him the last few weeks of his life. And, um, and Dale Chihuly knocks at the door. And as you know, he loves to buy things in collections. He doesn't buy one thing at a time. He likes full sw sweep of things. And he wanted all of Howard's chalices and uh, we just, bought all 12 of them that we had there at the house. Judy, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, Howard. You, you've talked about uh, the fact that he was not uh, um, a great lover of putting his work down in writing. I was curious, particularly during this period, um, when he was talking about his work and ceramic work, um, how earnest he was or not. Uh, um, uh, it, did he, could he get uh, heavy in talking about his work, or did he just sort of, um, I don't know, wear his work with a, a kind of lightness uh, as an artist and let other people do the talking? He was dead serious talking about his work. Mm -hmm. 
And when I think some of his students, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I was also a student. I was only all of 17 when I met him. I was just there because I followed my husband out to Ohio State who was working on his doctorate. I had already had a year at Queens College and painting. But when I met Howard and met Clay, it was like, a, 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 you know, a light bulb went off like for so many of us. And so he, he was ruthless. He, uh, you know, what are you doing that for? Questioning, questioning. What are you doing? Practice, go back. And I think um, uh, Irv and Mark and Michael Lucero, they all can attest that he was, he didn't talk much, but he really was pointed in what he said, and he would give scathing critiques. I think he was very smart. He didn't write things down. You know, it's a skill and an art to use to use language well. And I, I, I wanted, oh, sorry, I, I just wanted to interject very quickly. Um, when I was, I don't know, a very young curator, uh, the first oh. exhibition that I curated uh, was at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland. And so I got the run of their archives and uh, Howard had an early exhibition um, at that venue and his correspondence was so, um, I don't know, buttoned down and professional and there was some sort of um, accident or, or something that led to him having to put the show off. And uh, he was so apologetic and it was a bit of a revelation to, to see that correspondence from, from him and see how seriously he took his career. He printed all of his letters and all of his letters. I had archives of all the letters that he wrote to friends and archives of letters that were written back to him. He was very precise about behaving well and behaving professional. He had the utmost um, impeccable reputation for being um, a, a really um, um, meticulous in that regard. Okay, so Judy, just we like to, yeah, thank just you. Just go, go back to that slide. Just to say that those are, that's Raku and Egyptian paste. Uh, he was working in two different ways at right. this particular right. point. This and is this is it, Raku. You're right. Raku and one, and then the other thing is I, I mentioned it yesterday when we were in conversation. The image on the lower right, which is called a wing double bottle. There are times within um, Howard's work where I see reference, potential reference to Jim's Meltrit's work. Uh, sometimes it's very direct, but uh, Jim Meltrit had created a couple of bottle forms prior to the infamous uh, leg pot. And one of them was this wing bottle. And I'm not sure if perhaps Howard had seen that bottle exhibited uh, in San Francisco or not, but there is a certain kind of reference to uh, that form on the lower right. Great. Okay, well, you've already, uh, well, okay, so now we're going to get into uh, the appropriation of materials, other materials, mixed media. I think now you're beginning to see um, the luster glazes and the gold that came from Noritake. The use of decals, since Noritake was all decaled, um, uh, picking up from those. Um, but of course, the titles of these pieces, the, um, uh, the, the reference to vaginas and to uh, orifices and anuses, and etc., and all these slang words that you could possibly have for uh, anything sexual of how you would deal with the, uh, with, with the sex. So, I mean, hole grabber and muff pot. And when these came out, they caused a sensation. Um, I'm still amazed and thrilled actually, because um, he really walked down a road that nobody was walking down in clay to this extent. I mean, Gilhuli maybe, but he was um, too much of a Scientologist to go down this far, you know what I mean? Uh, he really, Howard was outrageous and he loved to be outrageous and, um, and then look to see if anyone was paying attention. Um, so I think that these are just uh, caused a great stir, but I'm still amazed. I was talking to Jeffrey Spahn the other night and he told me that there's a young, there's a whole new generation that is just thrilled with Howard's work, they can't get enough of him. 
So I'm going to move on now, Cloth. I, I think I'm talking too much, but um, I'm going to really move a little faster here. Uh, you've already shown your piece that you had with the lettuce leaves, and again um, with this obvious um, phallic symbol and the balls. Um, fabulous colors. Here we're getting. This is the pot I showed you, the deco pot, uh, the uh, the Noritake vase, and this is a direct copy of that. And inside, when I show you my collection, I'm going to show you the maquette to this piece. Uh, his love of deco, of course, mimicking Radio City Music Hall, the use of luster here. This is uh, gold luster here. Uh, the surfaces, the glaze surfaces. Um, he used commercially prepared glazes, uh, again, ahead of his time and appropriated. I wanted to show you, this was in the site show. This is a Noritake salt and pepper shaker. And obviously you can see that strong um, uh, geometric love and pattern that he took right from that. I wanted to show you this piece because um, this is how the pieces were assembled. So here's this fabulous stand with this um, base, which fit perfectly underneath this blue. So this whole section lifted up and sat down on this black piece. But he even glazed the back piece, the black piece, so that if it came disassembled, you would see that he cared enough that the inside that nobody would ever see was glazed. And then this long phallic piece, penis shape with the balls sat, sits on top here as a stopper. So then I wanted to show you the next piece where he might've gotten this idea from. These are the Noritake um, perfume bottles where the porcelain stopper, uh, the dauper that you put under each ear would fit into this opening, this crevice here, this opening. And I wanna just point out, if you're ever searching for the wild Noritake, as Howard would call it, because he loved the flea markets and searched for it everywhere. And all of us, all his students, all his faculty, everybody was searching for Howard. We were always going out looking for Howard to build up his collection. So this is the more, the M for the more and more brothers. This is the back stamp with Noritake across the top and then made in Japan. And this is the back stamp, the red back stamp, and they had a green one. And when they, this was with the import to America. And when they imported to England, the M went into a, a spider. And uh, so it was a different, they could distinguish it. Uh, again, I wanted to uh, show you more of the use of um, Paisley and um, the decal. Uh, and the lettuce, again, with that same shape. I have this piece on the right inside in my collection, and I'll show you. Uh, more of the same in terms of relevance to Noritake. And now we're gonna get to the cup in the mold concept. And this is a whole dissertation in and of itself. The idea of taking from industry um, what would normally be uh, a release from the mold Howard encapsulated, kept in the mold. And the titles, again, were incredibly important. The one here on the left is called Bushel and a Peck. And the use of contact paper, decal, um, mixed media, the impossibility of a mold being wood, but really being plaster. And then the bird even being wood, and then the cup and the whole thing camouflaged. So that, I mean, uh, what a play and mix up of um, pattern. Yeah, Paul, I would invite you to chime in too. And uh, I, I'd also like to kind of point out uh, the fact that Howard was using you know, contact paper and was using some decals that were unfired. And he has both an incredible sort of eye for and attention to micro detail, but then there also was a, a bit of a sort of wanton use of materials that makes uh, registrars and conservators a little bit crazy in this day and age. Um, Paul, would you like to talk? Can I throw that? something in? Y yes. Uh, who is that? Mark. 
Mark, please. The piece on the left, I made half of that piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not a bit surprised. And it, it's not contact paper. Liza and Larry Halverson oh, made right those here. wood decals for him. The bird oh. is yeah. the most interesting thing. He came to me and borrowed my bird mold. <laughs> and the first thing he made, he brought it back to me. And the bird was just sort of perched on the rim of the cup. And he said, what do you think? And I said, it doesn't look right. It doesn't have any legs. And he said, I didn't know birds had legs. <laughs> um, so he took it back and I remade it. I wanted to give a shout out. There are people here. Howard had one other great talent. He could spot talent. And many hands touched many of the things that you've shown. That's right. Yes. And he would come to you. I did a lot of the colorant work on the pots. I have a big Royal Paisley pot of my own. And I would sit in his office and write down color schemes. I draw little pictures. Same as title, same with title, Mark. Say what? The same with titles. Yes. I yes. A lot Thank of you, Irv. It's, it's lovely to see you. <laughs> Good to see I you. I mean, too. <laughs> he he was shameless about it. Yeah. And yeah. and and uh, Judy, thank you for the shout out to the many students who filled his Noritake and later uh, the Japanese dog knickknacks. Right. He had hundreds of eyes. We were all taught to look for the hallmarks. So we get the good ones. And it was cheap, and he knew we could get them for nothing. Unfortunately, so. I I have now twelve hundred pieces of Noritake. <laughs> well, I don't know what to do with. <laughs> well, he, he, I give you some. To me, these are the really interesting things about him. Um, was his ability to sort of ringmaster this circus of people, and he had really astonishing people at his disposal to work for him. So I thought you might, en I thought you might enjoy that little story about the bird because it was one of the funniest things I ever heard. Yeah. You know, I didn't you know, know birds had legs. What did they I, look like? I think it's very clear when we talked about the uh, old bag next door is nuts. Yes. How much yeah. Howard admitted in that and that uh, won him such a claim. And I think it was almost the starting point of collaboration in ways that he never dreamt possible. And let's, let, you are absolutely right. He told me that most of the pieces, the titles, the people that had working for him, it's not unlike Jeff Koons today, right? I mean, it all- Oh, exactly. Exactly. The, the, right. the, the, the mold series, I'll give you a little- I didn't get paid. <laughs> I'll, give you a little, I'll give you a little anecdote about that. The, when he started the mold series, he took a trip with Ann Courier and I to San Francisco. That's one where he sat in the front seat in his underpants because it was hot. And um, he was afraid they wouldn't let him into California because they asked if there were fruits or nuts in the car. And he got out a notebook and said, I own that. I painted the gun. He produced a little notebook and said, give me ideas. So many, many of these mold pieces were thought up and named by Ann and myself. Ann Perigo. Yes, Ann Courier. Yeah, Courier, right. Ann Courier. Courier, yeah. Mark, I wanted to ask you, you know, I know that um, I'm in this, flip through in this We're not particular do. series of cups, you know, there is the precious cup, there's mm -hmm. pre-cup, so there's an obvious nod to Jim Melchard's A's. Yeah. It was he, but there's something about the overall cup series that I think is really fascinating for me. It's only one half of the mold. Yes. It's the male half. Yes. If you look at it. And I'm curious, did he make that decision to use that half of the mold? You know, because it has the po it has the positive keys. I think he was always aware of the joke he was making about um Casting was cheating. You have to remember at the time a lot of the stuff was made. You weren't supposed to be doing any of this stuff. That's right. Right. And so what what he was doing there was 
thumbing his nose, which exactly. he, he, he loved to do. Exactly. Um, and I think that this gave him a chance to tell people that he was simply going to do whatever he wanted to do. And, um, and, and I think the other thing too is in the, excuse me, uh, Judy, in a lot of this work and even in the plates, like you do see a range of subject matter. So I'm curious if that's coming from, let's say his students or outside, like where, because sometimes it's, you know, high camp, or it's just a one-liner, and then other times it's very serious. How, so how is, I could talk I would, about the, the plates quite a bit. Okay, I'm just, and then, you know, I know Irv, you chimed in earlier on the um, chat box yeah. regarding the title of that Pope plate, but I also have plates in which it's the same plate and on the back it has two different titles. So I don't know if he also would have done that, just use the same image and then shifted the title. What he did was he, um, he was really, it, with the plates, he was really uh, a, 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 it's a fusion of collage, what was available to him visually, right. and what, how he could twist it to his own thought. And so with the, with the plates, um, especially the plates that you're that Judy's showing now, the, the, the flag and um, uh, some earlier pieces, he, uh, he had all, uh, tons and tons of commercial uh, decals that he bought by the sheets that he would never tell the students where he got. And he would take, and he had a great pair of whisk scissors. And he had, he, and he would just start cutting things up and putting them out there. And then he said, I need a title, I need a title. And then, <laughs> then you give him a title, you know? And then, you know, it, that could take all day, you know? And uh, he would, he, he, he could, whatever was in front of him, he could work with. That was what it is. And he didn't originate necessarily anything when I was around. He, he could just take it and twist it. And he was magnificent at it. Uh, and, and also, I, I just want to say one last thing and I'll shut up, is that uh, when he made those uh, pieces out, out of slabs, there was never any wasted clay. You could go into his studio and it'd be immaculate. There would never be little scraps of clay sitting around, ever. Because he oh. integrated that's everything. Whole, but that's his whole demeanor, don't yeah. you think? His yeah, demeanor was neat and clean yeah. and tidy, and his Fu Manchu mustache yeah, was yeah. always properly combed. He had yeah. a little comb in his pocket, and it also pared down his life of just a black suit and a white suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tons yeah. of t-shirts were just uh, uh, an indication of that. Um, I um, there was something. Oh, I have to tell you a little secret, which is not going to be a secret now. <laughs> One of the only things that I really, really saved that I didn't give to the Smithsonian because I just shipped off boxes and boxes of all his letters and archives just like a few months ago, I saved his decals. I have his original box, file box of all the decals of all of these plates. So <laughs> I didn't want them to go out in the world because I didn't want mimicking taking place. You know, it was like, um, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, we had a case of, uh, at Enseca, we, we, I was gonna be on this panel of uh, the, the power of mocking your work and artists mocking work. There were lots of people out there who were using that Paisley decal and making little cotlers so um, back stamps are very important for authenticating work. But maybe, I don't know, I, I trust that some of you will tell me what, how to properly, I guess a museum should have them, right, Goth? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can talk. Uh, so Judy, I want to point out, we might have 10 more minutes to kind oh of uh, touch on things. And we probably won't get your house tour, uh, which maybe we'll leave for another time. But I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time to talk about his monumental works and, um, you know, the last creative phase of his life. I, you know, I pulled everything out from shelves and put it on the table. I would forgo um, the rest of this talk if we just went into my... That would be fine too. I, I always like looking at artwork directly, which is what this series was born well, out of as well. Why don't we, why don't we live, have such a fabulous audience? Let's yes. see what they want. This next part, I was going to go into his silhouette and the use of his self-portrait. But that, you know, can be um, 
you know, I don't know, let, let everyone chime in. They want to see the real pieces in the collection or you want to move on? I vote, I vote, let's go uh, see your collection. And I think you're getting lots of those positive comments. Um, okay. So if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen okay. uh, and then you can walk into your living room and uh, uh, continue you know with the real thing and not the ersatz thing. All right, I just want to show you one picture that I put at the end here. And that's Howard when he was really relaxing in my backyard and that he did have a chance to, um, to relax. And then those of you who remember Super Mud, he came out with shirtless with these songs, throw, throw, throw your clay, throw it every day, all, all these fabulous lyrics that he wrote um, that we should sing. And he had everyone at Super Mud in Pennsylvania that was before Enseca or maybe during Enseca, I don't remember. But um, this Raku sung to smoke gets in your eyes. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now, um, uh, anyway, do any of you remember the super muds? <laughs> Mark, don't you remember singing those songs? A yes, lot of people don't remember a lot about super muds. Either. <laughs> okay, uh, now uh, stop share, okay. Yeah. There you go. And so you can do your quick Brady Bunch uh, um, switch. Uh, Paul, anything that you'd like to sort of chime in? It's, and also, it's really amazing to have uh, you and uh, Irv chiming in a perfect amount of um, sort of reality. Right. It's point. almost as though I could see this going on for hours and people oh, meeting and learning from each other. and because there's so many people with different histories. So that's what's really fascinating. And I've inherited, you know, this portion of the estate after Garth Clark and Shaw Guido and what I have in terms of um, inventory, you know, the book, some other documentation, but there is a lot, like there isn't as much information out there, but there are people that have this knowledge. And my friend, Kathy Dombach, who was in school at Ohio State, you know, knew him. So I'm just thinking it's really a shame that there isn't opportunities for this this generation to really document everything, not only, let's say, their teachers, but then also themselves, so that this information becomes available for future generations. You know, to really expand mm -hmm. upon. At the same time, I'm interested in how, you know, an artist of an earlier generation has inspired me as an artist and my thinking about not only ceramics and art, but also uh, issues within the LGBTQ community and um, how it's constantly changing as generations and different, the culture changes too. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of parallels. Um, do, you, do you see me here? I do, so I'm gonna yes. pin you so that we can uh, see you exclusively and uh, we've got a little bit of time. Um, and then I'll encourage everybody to stick around. Uh, I'm gonna stop the recording in about 10 minutes and feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your camera and say hi. Um, okay, so I was wondering, since so many people are here knowing, I have this portrait of Howard that one of somebody made, Mark or Irv or anyone, do you know who did this portrait of Howard? No, anyway, write it in. Anyway, here's the cat. Can you see it or am I going the wrong way? No, I can you're see looking, it. it looks great. Okay. Then I wanted to show you um, his mugs. I drink from them. That, that was the, at Ohio State, um, the, um, the throne quality of what he, uh, how good his throwing was. He also studied glass. When he got to, up to Seattle, um, he spent some time at Pilchuck, and uh, this was uh, just a sample of his glass work. This is a piece of, um, of the um, corn cob series, but this was just the shape. I called them elephant turds, but <laughs> they were um, the shape at least that he used, but then he started rolling these in the clay, in the corn. Cobb. And then I wanted to show you the maquette of the piece is of only like four inches tall of the piece that I showed you earlier. And then this is a piece of the um, 
Am I stepping back enough? Do you see? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. And so um, that is the, um, I, I just love the handedness. I'm going to get really close to look at his fingers and pushing the clay. I mean, as um, really getting into the dirty part of it. And I wanted to show you the inside. Yesterday, Paul wanted to say how it was attached inside. So I wanted you to see that it was just a leaf of the tear and repair, just, you know, just pressing it into the wet clay. Um, and then I love the, the, the void, the holes that he put into it. Just, I think it lightens it up and it does reiterate the stretching of um, the ooze. Not unlike, it's funny that I have it in front of these Vulcus plates, isn't it? <laughs> I just realized that it's right in front of all those stretching and pushing of the clay from the Vulcus plates. And then here's another one of those, um, of the, uh, I want you to see the inside. I mean, that is so sexy. And it just, it's just is so much about sex. So right now, while we're talking about sex and surface, Judy, uh, I wanted to point out something that we talked about yesterday, which is uh, I think a lot of people don't have an experience of Howard's later work directly and haven't gotten, you know, maybe have just seen them in the face-to-face -face book uh, or online. Um, and you can see through all of these pieces that, you know, he reveled in these very careful surfaces but the more geometric later pieces contain this depth of surface, but um, it's sublimated a little bit more. Can either you or Paul talk about that? Well, I just wanted to transition now because time is short, but I want you to see, I was gonna get into the uh, self portraits and the personality of himself uh, showing the Fu Manchu and the profile. I have it here on two pieces. This one is called Split Personality. And this one is in four parts. I'm going to get much closer. So there's a fabulous sanding, uh, of course, that is done on all these chisel parts. One is gold. The other is marble. Again, the uh, interplay of surface. and But it's all clay, so that juxtaposition. But the wonderful sanding, I think Howard's assistant is now Oh, I forgot his name for a minute. He works with Patty now. But I want you to see this is a, you know, it's split right here. So it's four, each piece is two, is two pieces. And the, under, the other side of this, which is outside, you can see it facing in is all black. And then the other one about Howard, about his personality, again, is using, Marty, would you come over? Can you lift that lid, that top off? Or is it too far? But I wanted you to see. Good collaboration. The, um, I wanted you to see this is how it is called Kotler posing as a cubist. And um, the, yeah, the top comes off. I oh, I don't leave it. But anyway, the top comes off. It, it's just like the perfume bottle. And uh, that's why. And then look how beautiful the, bot, the base is. Can you, let's see, can you see that? How it comes right into the, into the bottom. Just beautifully done. And then last, well, I want to show ah. you the large piece. The you know this is what he did in '89, the year of his um, death, um, the first part of the year because he died. It would only took six months. And then this is the little dog. And I I researched all the little dogs to show you where he took so much of this from. So, and this is the ashtray. And then I love this part because this part is the screw that comes out from the ashtray and it's kept separate and it moves. And then if you look inside, mm. it's all gold leaf. It's not glazed on, it's actual leaf. And then this is the, um, the and the dog moves. I mean, obviously it's, it's it's a it's moves like I'm moving it now. Um, what else do I want to show? Oh, so, oh and the last one that's of the lot the later larger pieces and then this is the lettuce leaf. I did a Georgia O'Keeffe 
um, lilies here in the lettuce one here. Sorry, there's so much other work around, like the viola fry, but the house is full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fitting. Um, do you want to see the plates? Or do we have time? Let's see, uh, it is exactly 2.30 now. Okay, good. Let's end with them, so that, that's great. Oh, wait, let me just show you that squirrel heaven is right, uh, right here. Sorry for the light on it. But again, like you showed the back, but look at the beautiful wood base that it's on. Again, Mark, uh, Mark uh, yeah, that's right. Mark, you knew him at, in Seattle. Yes. And Irv too, right? So I don't know who made the bases, but they were great. That's it from my, I'm sorry I didn't get into the other half, but uh, maybe it's to be continued. So let's make some pinky swears. Uh, you know, I know that as a curator and having the platform of the Everson, uh, Howard's never far from our thoughts. And, you know, I know that I will, in my curatorial career, be cooking up something around Howard and uh, the ways that he affected um, not just his students, but his students, students, and beyond. So um, I'm going to stop the recording in a moment, but I'd like to thank Paul, I'd like to thank Judy, I'd like to thank, you know, Irv and Mark and so many people who knew Howard. Um, I encourage you to turn on your cameras and say hi and we can keep the conversation going for another 15 minutes maybe. Um, feel free to uh, share now that we won't be <laughs> recording. Um, but join us next week. I don't have all of the details. Um, uh, nailed down for next week, but you can find us at www.everson.org or social media. And the Zoom link that you followed today uh, will be good for next week as well. So keep that Zoom link. Since we're advertising, I had all this time, I had a chance to revamp my website. So judyschwartz.com has just launched today. So uh, I have some articles there on Howard and the Noritake articles as well. And Paul, what is on top at uh, Paul Catula Projects once the air conditioning is fixed and the pandemic is over? I had to end a show of a painter um, named Jim Shatlin, who was uh, from Ohio, originally Finley, Ohio, and then was a pivotal player in the Detroit art scene in the 70s. Um, so his show will continue, it'll restart. And then I'm presenting an exhibition called uh, Mass Murder by Peter Williams, an African-American artist whose show was to debate debut earlier. It, this particular installation was shown at Q Foundation in New York um, two years ago, and it has to do with police brutality and incarceration. So it's a very, it's, it just happened at the right time. It was what we started talking about with the uh, um, session today, and it, it's how we'll, we'll end it as well. So uh, thanks, everybody. And I'm going to end the recording. And feel free to unmute yourselves thanks, and say hi. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.